But so welcome to the Illuminati podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Bond. Joining alongside me, Seth Barnador. Special guest today, he was Skolish. Uh, kind enough to join the show. How are you doing, coach? Man, I'm doing well. I appreciate y'all having me on. I appreciate it. And I know uh, you've got like a hard 30, so we'll, we'll keep it quick and in light, hopefully uh, somewhat entertaining. Uh, the last time you and I spoke was right after the spring game. You had big plans that weekend. Uh, how was Taylor Swift? Well, full disclosure, I didn't end up going. We, no. Uh, yeah, really disappointing. And uh, on a lot of levels, we had we had three official visits in that weekend. And I, like, after all of it, couldn't get away. So, but I'm sure it was awesome. <laughs> breaking news here on the on the blue moon Night podcast here I, I get it and you know let's kind of jump into i guess the the hot topic right now is uh yesterday so on wednesday um the board of trustees kind of announced their their agenda for the upcoming uh meeting and in there uh was the 200 million dollar basically approval for the on-campus facility the on-campus stadium um i think we i think everybody in this room, you know, Brian, yourself included, knew the stadium was happening. But this is a massive step in the right direction. Like, this is going to happen. There are going to be butts and seats at earliest 2026, right? Sure. No, exciting. Um, you know, it was part of part of when I went through the process um, of, of, you know, potentially taking this job. That was part of it. You know, I've spent time in the state. I've recruited here forever so I've always always looked at this program and in, in a lot of different ways I've always wondered man like when is the time to actually take this step and and make the change here to to play games on campus and so that was a huge part I, I give you that context that 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 was a huge part of me taking this job that was a huge part of me of me being here was was the fact that this was actually going to happen not just talk about it not just you know, have diagrams and pictures, but actually be able to tangibly say when, what's it going to look like, and what's the actual plan to get there. And to be honest with you, since December, um, when when I took the job on December 3rd, I guess, I don't know if I had the inside scoop that this was going to happen, but I, I guess I, in a lot of ways, knew it was going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, with the on-campus stadium, uh, you know, you have the indoor, which was great. You actually have something to show recruits. And now with this, it's it's going to help recruiting uh, eventually, if not already, with some of the, the kids who are you're actively recruiting. And uh, I want to kind of lead into this kind of recruiting portion of, of the conversation here with, with simply this, you know, the NCAA approved a rule a couple of years ago. First-year coaches are allowed to turn over the roster. Um pretty freely um a lot of processing in and out of players um how difficult is it for you to handle you, you know processing some guys out so you can open up some scholarships get guys in and also you know balancing the the team chemistry and everything else that kind of goes into it and it you know i think you guys have kind of flown under the radar this offseason with some some higher profile uh, schools kind of getting all the notoriety of the the processing out, so to speak. Yeah, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that the notoriety super matters. Um, yeah, you do as a, as a new head coach, you've got eighteen months to to essentially make changes as you need to. I think when when you're in a situation that that we're in in terms of being able to be a little bit under the radar, it probably helps. Um, you know, in, in terms of being able to, to lack of a better term, make changes to the roster. Um, you know, I, I was really, really cautious about coming into the situation and saying, well, we've won four games in three years. Like, I'm well aware of that. So, man, I should get rid of everybody and go get a bunch of new guys. I think the the flip side of that was, man, who is here that can play? Who is here that over the next five months can buy into the process of what it's going to take for us to win. And so I was really cautious early to say, hey, we're just going to get rid of everybody. And I really wanted to go through the spring and put my own eyes on, on every single guy within this program, scholarship and walk-ons, and, and then make really, really educated decisions. Um, I think if, if I was going off of last year's film, I'd make one set of decisions 
And I could give you a handful of guys that, that, and I won't right now just because I want to see how it all pans out, but a handful of guys that whether the previous staff and my exit interviews with the, with the staff that we let go or exit interviews with the players in December that I'd say, man, this guy hasn't played here or this guy hasn't done anything on the field here to help us that after spring, you're like, wow, breath of fresh air, second, second opportunity, man, this guy really can play. This guy really is good for our culture. So for us, it's been monumental. We have flown under the radar in a lot of ways, which is good. That's exactly where I want to be um, to be able to make changes. And I think at the end of, at the end of this entire cycle, we're, we're going to end up with anywhere from 39 to 42 new scholarship players on our roster, which is like, like I've never been a part of it before, but they were changes that were needed. They were changes that we felt like were best for the, for the program, certainly for our roster. And we're still like, even walking down the hall here. That's why I was two minutes late. We're talking about a potential guy that we didn't think we had a shot at. Now we do. So you're consistently working through essentially putting the best roster you possibly can, both from a, from a true talent perspective and certainly as a cultural fit to what we're trying to get done here. And so it's been monumental. I, I, I would imagine we've taken advantage of it Mm-hmm. Maybe as good as anybody in the country. Absolutely. Coach, st- sticking with recruiting, you've been a coordinator, recruiting coordinator at a multiple stops in the past. What, without getting too specific, what's kind of your strategy in recruiting? Are there certain like measurables you're looking at, or is it just kind of best player, best fit? What, what, what's kind of your strategy there? Yes, I, th- I think, I think really twofold. One, it starts with what your needs are, you know? And I think that's, that's the biggest thing of like, as we went through the spring, what are our actual needs, right? I, I've stood in countless press conferences and it's been pointed out to me that we were the worst defense in the country last year, which in, in some categories we were, and believe it or not, in some categories we were second or third worst. So you come in and write the panic and you would say, man, like we got to replace the entire defense. And then you go into spring ball and, and you're like, man, I don't know that it's, it is the entire defense. There's, there's certainly some schematic things that, that we can do better. There's certainly spots you could put guys in to be better equipped to make plays. And I say all that in the context of it starts with what do you need? So attacking the needs first, um, you know, in terms of measurables. Yeah. I think in the perfect world, you know, like, like we spent two weeks this spring on scouting school, meaning each position coach had parameters that they talked through and you're looking at certainly measurables, but then you're looking at intangibles. You're looking at like outlier situations of man. Like if the guy is not in this measurable range, what is he? Well, he's got elite traits of speed or elite traits of power or, you know, whatever it is you're looking at, at, at the end of the day, filling your needs first. And then as you go through your needs and and you use certainly measurables, parameters of what you're looking for, and then where are those outliers? A lot of the time when you're, when you're taking over a program and, and for whatever reason, the good Lord's blessed me with taking over some programs that had been struggling. Uh, and, and I think those are the coolest challenges because you can really do it from scratch and do it however you want. But needs first, staying within certain parameters, character being part of that, right? Like like the worst thing you can do is get rid of a young man that you don't feel like fits your culture and then bring in another guy that's just as bad for the culture. So character is part of those intangibles that you're looking for. Fit your needs first and then always save save a couple of spots for, man, like like I don't necessarily have a need, but it's one of these like situations, Seth, where it's like, man, I don't need a dollar, but I would certainly take a dollar. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I ain't broke, but I take 50 cents type situation. So I think you're constantly looking to make your roster as good as you, you possibly can, but filling needs first. Like, like you look at us going into the spring and it was like, like, like whether you know anything about our football or not, like we had O linemen that we had to replace and we had D linemen we had to replace. Well, holy smokes, like you better address that wide out, right? We lost, we lost a lot of production. Like 
it doesn't take a genius to say, man, you better bring in some wideouts that can come in and help you. So at the same time, man, what's in the program? Who are the young guys that maybe redshirted that, that, or didn't play for whatever reason, like, can those guys play? Cause it's certainly easier to develop players than it is to bring in guys from the portal. Um, so because they're developed the way you want, they're developed in your system, they're developed and bought into your program. Those guys will always play harder than somebody you bring in and for lack of a better term, be a six month rental of some sort, you know, so certainly parameters, certainly needs first and, and then fill it, fill the rest of it with, with guys that you think can help you in some way within your program. And, and to, to stay, oh, go ahead, Nate. Yeah, to, to the recruiting point there, um, it seems over the last, since you've basically gotten here, uh, you're hitting on a, a impressively high clip on official visits. If you get them here, there's a really good chance they're committing. What What's going on, you know, during that what, three-day experience when you finally get them on campus? What, I don't, you know, don't want to, you know, trade secrets or anything but what what's the the you know one thing you if you had to say to the fans like this is the one thing i got to make sure i do and convey to this recruit and if i can do that properly there's a higher than likely chance they're going to commit that sunday yeah nathan that's a good question man i i think i think what's always worked for me is just be be us you know i i really feel like we put an elite staff together of a bunch of men and women that are just real people. Like, like I don't have a, a cliche thing or, or like, man, this is what we do on these visits. Um, part of the visits here is, you know, I've, I've done visits in Ames, Iowa. I've done visits in Champaign, Illinois. Like, like we do have an incredible city to show off, you know, that there's, there is a coolness factor to, to staying downtown on the water. And, and that's what you're looking at. Um, but at the same time, I don't want a kid to come here because it's, because it's Tampa, you know, like Tampa is cool. Winning football games is way cooler. So you're, you're selling what you have in the program to sell. What we've done is put an elite staff together and not just coaches, young coaches, support staff, player development, our strength staff is second to none in the country, you know, from a process and a plan to help these guys get to where they want to go. And a lot of that has to do with development. How are you going to feed them? How are you going to educate them? How are you going to give them the tools they need to potentially keep playing um, and, and have a chance to play in the National Football League? And to be honest with you, the only thing I really, really sell um, in terms of what I promise a kid and his parents is, is really three things. One, they're going to leave here with a career. Um, not a, a degree, um, a, a, everybody will promise you a degree and, and a lot of people have degrees. I don't know if you guys have degrees, but there's a lot of people that got degrees. Um, a career is what a lot of people don't have. Uh, and so we're, we're selling, Hey, we're going to network you in the 11th biggest media market in the entire country. One of the fastest growing business atmospheres in the entire country, with an alumni base that's second to none in terms of pure numbers of people that can help you have a career, whether that's in business, entrepreneurship, medicine, sales, whatever it may be, you're going to have an opportunity here more so than a lot of other places to actually network and have a career. That's number one. We're going to demand that there's professional development, networking going on, whether you make it to the NFL or not, that you're going to have a career when you leave here. And the, the last two parts of that are you're going to be surrounded by incredible men and women, and we're going to take whatever foundation you come from. Some guys are coming from two-parent homes, single-parent homes, really good situations, really bad situations, but we're going to surround you with elite men and women of character. And I think just as much women as important as men, I've got an 11-year-old daughter, like we've got, we've got 11 women that work on my staff that are strong, powerful women. I think young guys need to see examples of that. But a bunch of guys that are not scumbags, that are really good men of character, that we will teach you, we will take this foundation that you already have, whatever it is, and we will give you incredible examples of what husbands look like, fathers look like. And if you can leave here with a, with a career, 
and have incredible examples of what fathers and husbands look like, and that's what you are in society when you're done, that's a win for me. And so that's what we sell them. There, there's not really a whole lot more than that. What you can sell from a football side is certainly offensively what, what we've been able to do at the previous places is a great selling tool. If you want to play offensive football in an elite clip, there's not a better coach in the country to help put you in positions to go be successful. There's actual evidence of that. And it's that part is relatively easy to sell on the defensive side of the ball. Todd Orlando has coached and been a coordinator for so long can show you videotape evidence of what he's been able to do from a development standpoint. And you look at our staff, you got guys like Kevin Patrick, who has put first rounders in the, in the NFL for years from here to NC state to Texas tech to back to here. Like he's done it. You got our, our secondary coaches, James Rowe, who just spent six years in the national football league. The guy left the DB job of the Chicago bears on his own merit to come back to his alma mater and coach here. Like you want to play in the NFL, that guy can tell you because he just coached those guys. So you start putting together a staff of guys that can actually help get you there. Well, now you sell the life after football part and the football part. And inevitably, if guys are interested in any of that, that they end up here. If guys are interested in something else, they don't end up here. And, and that's a win for us. Coach, talking about uh, the staff you put together, how are um, what's the transition been like for them? I know, like back in the day, Chip Kelly, Oregon, they would have to teach off the film because they'd be going so fast. Is that how you guys structure practice, where you're just trying to get reps, 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 and you have to kind of teach on it later? Or, and if so, what's that transition like for those kind of for coaches that haven't coached in that before? Um, yeah, I, I think absolutely not, Seth. It's not like we just go fast, 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 and then you just hope no, it doesn't look like a big pile of shit at the end. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that would be silly. But um, but no, practice is structured. Our whole program is structured that there's certainly a tempo at which we, we do things. But it's set up essentially in parts to be able to teach fundamentals, teach technique, and then doing it in small groups and executing that technique and and certainly their assignment in groups. And then you get to team settings and there's certain portions of practice where offensively we can still replicate the tempo without potentially snapping the ball super fast, but lining up to be able to keep the offensive mechanics the way we need them while allowing the defense to get lined up and letting them actually be able to recognize what's going on and, and not, not, um, put their technique and assignments in jeopardy. And then there's certain parts of practice where it is, you got to, you got to go fast on offense and, and defensively we got to line up and play as fast as we can as well, which in a lot of ways prepares them. Cause when, when they see somebody a little bit slower, then it's certainly a little bit easier because they got more time. So um, there's every aspect of it is certainly calculated and talked through and thought through but no, we don't just line, put the ball down and go as fast as you possibly can. I think a lot of people probably do. Um, I don't know that we would be able to last from a, from a physical standpoint on either side of the ball because you just run guys into the ground. And how, how much does that kind of tempo permeate the organization? I noticed, you know, watching you guys at Tennessee last year, the ball boys are like pushing guys back in bounds when they're on the sideline. And, and it's like, really like everybody's involved how how much does that kind of the tempo kind of permeate throughout the organization yeah seth very much so um you know I, everything we do has got a sense of urgency to it um and we we work out that way we we certainly practice that way but no everybody's got to be on board um you, you're kind of getting into some trade secret stuff there where i'll probably let that go okay. job security it, trade secrets are job security. So <laughs> I got you. I got that. you. But, we'll but you, that. you've got the gist of it, though, in terms of you no, know, everybody's got to be on board from sports med to to your your uh, ball boys to your managers to certainly your coaches. Um, there's a sense of urgency with which you you do everything, um, and that's strength training, 
to speed training, to all of it, everybody's got to be on the same page. I, I think whether we were a fast tempo offense or not, there's got to be a sense of urgency with that within your program. And there's got to be a continuity and an alignment within the program where everybody understands what you're trying to do. Um, and so that's, that's certainly a huge part of it, but yeah, everybody's on the same page with, with what we do. And, you know, I've seen, you know, some teams show a different way to kind of play effective defense when you have, you know, up tempo and, and a good offense was, how important was it to bring in a guy like Todd Orlando who has a history of being able to generate turnovers so consistently? Yeah, imperative for me. Um, I needed I needed somebody on that side of the ball that that can essentially be be one experienced in in running a side of the ball. Um, certainly, making sure that he can manage the staff on that side and the players. Uh, and I spend a ton of time uh, over there with those guys. Uh, I spend almost the first half of practice on the defensive side because I, contrary to public b belief, I actually play defense and, and love defensive football. So I love going over there and, and giving my two cents and, and certainly coaching on that side of the ball. But no, to get Todd was, was imperative for me. And we had had many conversations going years back to, um, if I ever have the chance to hire Todd, I, I would certainly do it and, and really fortunate that he he wanted to come and and um, and he's been monumental for me in terms of of what he's been able to handle over there, both from a from a scheme side and the recruiting side that that he's been he's been imperative. He's a vet. He's one of those guys that that nothing phases him. You can ask him to do it one way and he'll do it that way. If he doesn't agree with it, he'll tell you why. Um, and the guys in, in our program have really bought in and and love love what he's about. He, he, like you asked about recruiting, man, just a just a genuinely incredible man that cares about his players, that coaches them really really hard, and then loves them even harder. Like just an incredible incredible guy, and I, I think unique a little bit because I coached against Todd for four years at, when he was at the University of Texas, and I know the problems it created for us. And he's very much, I see him very much as like an offensive guy over there where he'll find the, he'll find the issue you've got on offense and attack the hell out of it. And that's the scariest thing as an offensive coach is, is if somebody can find your weakness and attack it consistently, he's been able to do that for 30 years. Uh, that's, uh, that's fair. That's a great, great insight from you, coach. I, I want to kind of, and things on on a fun note, um, I know you guys uh, over the last week or so have kind of promoted. Um, you did, you know, the the fifty set fifty six questions, and there was a few things that kind of stuck out uh, to Seth and I. And Seth, I think you you have a a, a question that you you were kind of wanting to ask him uh, here today. Yeah, coach, you said Mighty Ducks, greatest trilogy of all time. Uh, which Mighty Duck do you think would be the best football player? Man. Mm, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, Bolton Reed did allegedly have scholarship offers. So, I mean, he's kind of on the table, I guess. But. Yeah, but but speed kills. What was the guy's name that that could skate really, really fast but couldn't stop? Do you remember? I can't remember his name. I just remember oh, from I, Miami. I, I know he was Benny the Jet Rodriguez. Yeah, that's what I, I just think that's, Benny the Jet Rodriguez. That's all I know. Yeah, it would be that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? We could find a way to get him open. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you just like force Gump and you just keep running after he scores with stop eventually. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and so you and I kind of have a weird connection, not personally, but we're both uh children of immigrants. Uh my my I was born in uh Ireland, uh immigrated to the States. I That's think shocking. I, I would have never guessed Ireland for you. <laughs> right? Can you tell? Um as someone who didn't grow up around football, like that wasn't a thing my first four or five years of life. And finally, you know, finding football later, later in my childhood, what, what was the biggest disconnect between like your parents and you and what you wanted to do for fun uh, growing up as a child in the States? Yeah. Um, I think that just the fact that I don't know that they ever really understood that this could be a career. <laughs> you know, I, I think I remember my grandma uh, when she was still alive, she, she asked, 
you know, like as I got, I think I was maybe a GA at that point. And she's like, Hey, well, what do you do in the spring and like the winter? Like, are you going to coach like, like track and wrestling or like, like now nah, grandma, like, like there's like actually stuff to do in the winter and the spring and the summer, you know what I mean? Like in her mind, it was like a, a four month deal. Um, I think my parents, it was the same, like, like, understanding what actually goes into football and and really at any level there's you know at the high school level guys are are training year round their spring ball and like i think you know just even the mandatory training in the summer like it's a 365 day deal and i think that was the biggest i don't know a disconnect but probably the biggest shock to them is that like if you're going to play football you got to do it year round if you're going to play basketball at a high level you got to do it year round like I think that was probably the biggest shock to them. Um, you know, we grew up around soccer and hockey. Um, and um, I never got into the soccer thing because I think probably the, just simply the conditioning element and the running up and down a soccer field. My son has genetically gotten that. He he doesn't like to run. Um, and um, And the hockey thing, I loved hockey growing up and my wife won't let my son play hockey, but... Um, but we're hoping that at some point, um, he'll pick that up, but, but I, I've always really, really loved hockey and what it is and the physicality of it. But, um, I think just them learning what, what the culture of what playing football at, at really any level is that it's a year round deal. And, uh, it's certainly a physical deal. And, and I think that they slowly, as I've, as I've done this for a while now, I've learned, man, like it's shocking what the strategy is, you know, and, and uh, that that you can still actually out coach people and out scheme people where maybe in soccer, you so much can't. Um, I imagine in hockey, probably a little bit harder to do, too. But but I think that's probably the biggest culture shock to them is just how much time actually goes into it. All right, I got a lot more questions, but we're running out of time. So uh, another what thing, I gave you five more minutes. Do you want five more minutes? I'd love five more minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Oh, I'll, I'll push you. my I'll push my uh, terrible question to the end then. Uh, <laughs> I do have, five minutes as long as you don't write anything shitty about me on Twitter. Is that good? Deal. I'm very positive on Twitter. Let's What's go. the statute of limitations on that, Coach? Uh, four years. Fair enough. Yeah, well, I'm good with that. <laughs> I I, I want to know. Um, I think everyone when they talk about your offense, they talk about the passing game. Just going back to your time at UCF, you got you've had a really interesting run game. And it has been really effective. Um, why don't Why don't you think? Do you think it's just that people want to talk about the passing game, or why, why don't you think the run game gets as much mention? Because you guys are really, really good in that department. Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask your counterparts in the media. I, well, we talk about the run game a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, we were we were a year ago. We were the only team in the country to rush for two hundred and throw for three hundred. Um, in on average in every single game. So I don't know. Uh, my last year down the road there, we were, I want to say sixth or seventh in the country in rushing offense. Um, so it all starts with the run game. Uh, our kids know that our certainly as we recruit, everybody knows that um, it, the only way you, the pass game becomes what it is, is, is if you can effectively run the ball. And I think that's in any offense. Um, I don't care if it's West coast or, or spread or under center, it doesn't matter. Like if you can't run the ball effectively, it's virtually impossible to throw it um, where we've, where we've been really successful is just because of the way that we do it. Um, you know, in, in terms of using splits and and using the entire width of the field to our advantage. Um, sometimes that advantage is in the pass game. Sometimes that advantage is in the run game. And the way we're built, you have the ability to take advantage of either one on just about every play. Um, so it's not, you know, it doesn't take rocket science, but if the if you get a light box, you're going to run the ball. If you don't, you're going to throw it. Uh, but I but I don't think you'll ever get a, you know, a a light box if you're not willing to run it. And so we spend we spend a ton of time on the run game. Um, I don't know if it's more than the pass game, but certainly as much, probably more. Um, in terms of finding ways to be able to run the football, it all starts with the run game. Um, otherwise, you can't play action pass, and and you certainly don't create windows for yourself to be able to throw the ball. Good. One of my favorite uh, run schemes the last few years has been um, – I, I first saw it with you guys at UCF. 
it was count it was like a counter look to the same side as the wing where the wing comes like he's coming across and like split and then comes back and follows the guard is that something you guys came up with man if i took credit for that would you believe me i would i i, I hadn't seen the two of the same side before then so i would i would believe you okay awesome <laughs> yeah we came up with that <laughs> where'd you get that from nowhere we invented it did you yeah oh, absolutely okay. Seth, here's here's the key to being a good coach. I'm gonna throw it out to you right now. You 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 steal other people's ideas and you make them a little bit better, and then you claim that you came up with them. That's coaching 101. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. You can you can make a living doing that actually. Yeah, you can sell systems <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> All right, oh. Seth let's uh let's wrap this up let's get your your one question i know i, I kind of want to hear this as well um go we're ahead. still on that four-year statute of limitations right yeah absolutely yeah, we're good absolutely yeah so i have a i have a question so again that 56 question piece um you mentioned the movie heavyweights mm. when you watch a lot how do you think tony perkis would do as a college strength and conditioning coordinator um not well um no. no you know like all joking aside i i think what what these kids want um and and geo our our head strength coach does an incredible job and he's really set the culture of our program in a lot of ways kids want to want to want to know why right like this day and age where it's super easy to look up just about anything on on this thing or whatever you got that you're going to look it up on like kids want to know why um certainly offensively defensively from a scheme standpoint um but in that strength world there's so many different philosophies so many different ways to do it um that you can you can convince a kid to do whatever you want to convince them to do but if you give them a why they'll generally buy in um and so uh, tony gave no why he just just made guys do mean things and took candy bars away and um snacks like snacks are a huge part integral part of uh of being able to maintain a physique you know what i mean like to be able to build muscle and recover like you gotta have snacks well he took snacks away um so and he gave no why for anything he was doing so i would say would not be successful in any way and he's he's a, a jerk and this transfer portal era you can't be a jerk you know what i mean well, it'd be a big expose on tony parker <laughs> no doubt great movie though we actually had it on saturday night um um uh, my my little guy bear loves loves heavyweights loves heavyweights loves the mean green um and in in some ways appreciates the mighty ducks uh and loves little giants that's another like you talk about an elite movie that's a good yeah. one yeah mm -hmm. that's a good one. Hey, last question we'll get you out of here you know, talked about the Mighty Ducks. Is there a, a football movie um, that you like? If it's on, you're you're stopping and watching for 20 minutes, no matter what part of it's at. Hmm. A football movie. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, probably Little Giants. Longest Yard's good. Um, the original or the Adam Sandler one? The Adam Sandler one. Um, the um what was the movie um the the southwest texas armadillos um was it with, unnecessary uh, roughness or necessary roughness necessary roughness that's another really good one um you know to be honest with you i'll give you a funny one here uh, a good one the program program you guys are about my age the program came out when i was like middle school or high school um and one of the one of the coolest movies that I remember, like, man, like that's what recruiting is like, you know, and that's like, like kid fumbles, you make them carry the ball around. And my memory of that movie, I have it on DVD. I don't have a DVD player, but I have the movie on DVD. And, uh, and like, that was one of my favorite movies more like when I was in high school, I don't watch it a bunch because my kiddos, there's like some stuff in there where I wouldn't want them to see yet. But um this was when I was at at Iowa State kept talking about the movie none of those guys like this makes you feel old but none of those guys in my room had ever seen it 
And so I'm like, listen, we're going to come over to my house. We're going to have dinner and then we're going to watch the program. And so we did it. And now those guys were like really highly intelligent. I had a room of tight ends that were like brilliant. They left the house that night, like with and lost a lot of respect for me. And we're like, Coach, that's the biggest idiotic <laughs> movie we've ever seen. I was like legitimately hurt, disappointed. And so I tried to do the same thing um, when I was coaching down the road and those guys left with just about the same sentiment. And then, so I'm like, I'm going to give this one more shot at, at Tennessee and had a bunch of the offensive guys over to the house and we watched the program and they literally were like, coach, you're a complete idiot. And so <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if I just appreciated it a lot more at that point, but you know, like we played South Carolina last year at South Carolina. I walked into that stadium. I was like, man, this is where they shot like one of my favorite movies of all time. And, um, and nobody else appreciates it as much. So I'm going to rewind. My answer to the question would be the program. Um, and, uh, and my, just my kids haven't seen it yet. And I'm not going to show these guys here at USF because they'd probably say the same thing that I'm an idiot about that movie, but that movie was incredible. I thought when I was like 14 and I'm like, man, this is what it's like to get recruited. And, you you get a, go to an official visit on a bus and then there's cheerleaders and all this cool stuff and and turns out there actually isn't that but <laughs> it, uh, but yeah that's that would be it the program now if little giants is on i'd stop and watch it um longest yard necessary roughness those are all like elite um elite movies but uh the program i i always thought was really cool plus there was only two coaches which i thought was interesting just the guy coaching offense and a guy coaching defense man that would They're, make my way easier they really short change the coaching staffs in these movies it's like one <laughs> or two guys all everyone replacements you've got like three coaches yeah that's another one that that's a, that's a solid movie yeah absolutely well coach we've taken up so much of your time i really appreciate it Thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully it was a little bit more different than uh, some of the other interviews you've done. Um, good luck closing out. I know you've got a big uh, postgraduate camp coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, good luck, you know, getting, getting some, getting some guys in here. I appreciate it guys. Y'all have a great day. Four years. I'm keeping receipts <laughs> too. So I got Fair you enough. coach. We're good. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks. Me on. I appreciate it. Right. Appreciate, appreciate it. Coach. Coach.